Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News, our India's voice to the world. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran, coming up in the next hour. India's President Draupadi Murmu launches the country's first homegrown gene therapy for the treatment of blood cancer. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi addresses an election rally at Jamui in the state of Bihar. Prime Minister Modi and West Bengal Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee to address rallies at Kuch Bihar in West Bengal. UN suspends Gaza nighttime aid movements for two days. Humanitarian food charity The World Central Kitchen calls for an independent investigation into the killing of seven of its workers in the enclave. And rescue efforts continue in quake hit Taiwan, at least nine killed and more than a thousand injured. India's President Draupadi Murmu launched the country's first homegrown gene therapy for cancer treatment at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Gene therapy is used mainly to treat blood cancers and have burgeoned in the past few years. It will cost one-tenth that of comparable commercial products available globally. ceremony of India's first gene therapy is a major breakthrough in our battle against cancer. At this line of treatment named CAR T cell therapy is accessible and affordable. It provides a new hope for the whole of humankind. I am sure it will be successful in giving new lives to countless patients. Everyone associated with this humanistic initiative deserves congratulations. CAR T cell therapy is considered to be one of the most phenomenal advances in medical science. It has been available in the developed nations for some time, but it is extremely costly and beyond the reach of most patients around the world. What is new about the therapy being launched today? as I understand it, is that it costs 90% less than what is available elsewhere. And Yogesh Sheetal joins us from Mumbai. Yogesh, for the benefit of viewers joining us from around the world, what is gene therapy and why is this Indian design being seen as a breakthrough in the treatment of blood cancer? See, the gene, gene therapy basically, uh, you know, uh, this is centric on the cell therapy. Uh, in generally, what we see that how cancer patients are treated through, chemo, uh, through uh, chemotherapy as well as through multiple uh, ways like uh, uh, surgery and also through radiation. Now, how this therapy is different, you have asked a very straight question. So, I'll just come to the, uh, 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 come to something that uh, we have just learned from the scientists here who have just gathered in IIT where I am studying right now in IIT campus. Uh, scientists from Tata Memorial Center as well as from the IIT. They have just uh, made some very important revelations on the entire, uh, you know, entire method and how the therapy works basically. This is how it happens. The cells are basically taken from the body and then cells are just strengthened and made available in the way that it could resist and it could, uh, you know, uh, uh, just deal with that cancer cells. So this is basically, you can see in, chemo in chemotherapy, basically we see that the injection or through uh, some multiple ways, uh, uh, medicines is dropped, medicine, medicines injected in the body and there are, uh, there are certain outcomes, there are certain side effects also that is uh, quite visible. But in this case, there is no side effect and also there are other things. We, we, uh, I can uh, tell you the three important aspects why this therapy is going to be very important. In fact, landmark in the way to cancer treatment, affordability, 
accessibility and the third is opportunity affordability as also the prime uh, the president already said and you have also rightly mentioned that this is going to be a, a you know affordable for indian co coming to indian population and in mumbai what we see number of uh, scores of uh, you know cancer uh, cases are detected uh, uh, monthly yearly in india and different pockets of india accessibility accessibility coming to accessibility and affordability the one tenth cost just if you compare the entire cost of the treatment then this is just ar around one tenth of the cost that uh, uh, right. a cancer patient has to bear uh, if, if if the treatments is taken from any western country second thing accessibility since the medicine has been the, uh, developed in india it's completely indigenous so uh, on the line of make in india as well as atmanirbhar bharat this is going to be accessible easily accessible to the patients and they don't need to you know a wait in a long queue uh, to get that treatment third opportunities as we have seen recently in the last two decades we have seen the entire era of uh, it development information technology and the uh, entire it system it cities have been set up also the prime minister has time and again said and also many experts have said in the time to come there are lots of opportunities in the field of medicine and uh, uh, that you know a uh, startup in the field of uh, uh, medicine and medical science so multiple things there are multiple pillars right. and this is going mm -hmm. to be a definitely a landmark thing at this point in time yeah ramesh absolutely you. as my colleague yogesh is pointing out uh, this is not only affordable and accessible but it also opens up new opportunities in the field of medical treatment in general and treatment of cancers in particular yogesh thank you that was my colleague yogesh sheetal reporting from mumbai let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in india Leaders of political parties have intensified their election campaign. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed a public meeting at Jammuvi in the state of Bihar. It was the Prime Minister's first rally in Bihar since the announcement of the election dates. Addressing the rally, he warned the opposition of the anger in the citizens of India against their corrupt activities. JD Congress आपके हक के सारे पैसे भी लूट लेते और आपसे साइन भी करा लेते क्या पैसा मिल गया है आज देश के सारे भ्रष्टाचारी जो हमेशा एक दूसरे से लड़ते थे एक दूसरे पर भ्रष्टाचार के आरोप लगाते थे एक दूसरे को जेल में बंद करने की मांग कर रहे थे अब वो सब मिलकर मोदी आया भ्रष्टाचारी कान खोल करके सुन ले ये मोदी नहीं आया 140 करोड़ देशवासियों का भ्रष्टाचारियों के प्रति गुस्सा निकल करके आया है In the afternoon Prime Minister Modi will head to the state of West Bengal where he will address a rally in the Kooch Bihar constituency. The BJP has renominated Nishit Pramanik who is the Minister of State for Home Affairs from Kooch Bihar. Now West Bengal's Kooch Bihar constituency is gearing up for a fiery election campaign on Thursday. Besides the Prime Minister, West Bengal Chief Minister and TMC Chief Mamata Banerjee will hold a rally in Kooch Bihar. Ms. Banerjee will hold a public meeting at Matabanga's Gumani Hut for TMC candidate Jagadish Barma Basunia. Kooch Bihar will go to the polls in the first phase of election. and my colleague prasenjit bakshi joins us for more prasenjit what more can you tell us about the kooch bihar constituency and the two rallies that would be held by the prime minister and chief minister there right uh, ramesh this is the first high voltage uh, type of a uh, uh, campaign we must say in west bengal uh, at one side it would be the um chairperson of trinamool congress and at the same time chief minister of west bengal and on the other side the prime minister of the country and the senior leader of bjp narendra modi so in the same constituency kochbihar it is going to happen 
any moments from now uh, um, uh, the, the the followers of trinamool congress they are waiting at their venue and followers of bjp they are waiting at their venue the importance of coach we are um, uh, is a very a very very uh, 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 the crucial for the uh, west bengal uh, politics or the or among the 42 seats of west bengal because as you said that um, it is a seat of uh, uh, minister of state for home affairs nishit pramanik so it is a prestige fight for you know, pramanik personally uh, bjp as a whole and it is a fight for pramanik and bjp to retain the constituency for the second term and for um, the trinamool congress um, it is a, a, a challenge for them because in the first phase all the three constituencies were you know, taken away by uh, bjp in the 2019 election those are alipur dwar coach bihar and jalpaiguri in the northern part of the uh, of west bengal so this time uh, for the last few days uh, uh, trinamool congress leader mamta banerjee is camping in, in those areas and uh, trying to get back uh, their uh, age old uh, uh, support base in, in those three constituencies particularly in coach bihar because coach bihar was represented by a central minister so uh, uh, these are the uh, uh, what i must say that political significance in other way in a, in a previous meeting in in the morning uh, chief minister has identified one issue particularly that uh, uh, don't spare the the central investigative agencies so uh, in a political arena this has become a uh, talk of town or right. talk of the entire state mm -hmm. that uh, whether this uh, central agency is the target of mamta banerji and now uh, everybody is waiting that how the uh, thing is explained by the bjp leader and prime minister uh, narendra modi his scheduled is around 3:30 Ramesh. All right, we leave it at that. Uh, Prasenjit Bakshi, thank you for now. Appreciate it. In other news, a notification for the second phase of election will conclude on Thursday. An election will be held in 88 parliamentary constituencies in 12 states and union territories, along with the remaining part of the outer Manipur constituency in this phase. Right, joining me is my colleague Amit Mukherjee. Amit, what more can you tell us about the notification for phase two of election and some key seats that will go to the polls in this phase? Uh, now, Ramesh, uh, our Indian election is a very, very elaborate uh, process, as you just mentioned in your, uh, you know, bulletin. And uh, in a pa as a part of this entire process, I mean, uh, filing of nominations is also a very, very integral part of this entire exercise, whereby the Election Commission of India decides on certain dates during which all these candidates who will be contesting in the upcoming elections, they need to file their nominations. Uh, so today, which is uh, 4th of April, today is the last day for filing of nominations uh, for 88, in fact, 89 Lok Sabha constituencies, which are spread across 12 st state and one union territory across India. And uh, one of the most uh, key constituencies everybody is looking at in, during this phase is uh, Rahul Gandhi's. He'll be contesting on the 26th of April, which is the second phase of elections from Wayanad, uh, Kerala, where he filed his nominations yesterday. Uh, so uh, as a part of the entire process, uh, now the election commission will now be evaluating all these nominations which have been filed by the respective candidates uh, because they have certain norms and uh, norms that they need to adhere to. So the election commission uh, officials who have been designated for this purpose will be going through the details uh, filed by various uh, candidates. They would be uh, scrutinizing the authenticity of all these. Now, Rahul Gandhi, he has filed, you know, interesting part is that he has filed his nomination whereby he has stated his assets to be around 20 crores and his income to be around 1 crore. And those are the things that most of the candidates, you know, the kind of assets they have, their education qualification, these are the things they file during their nominations and these are being evaluated, uh, will be evaluated by the uh, designated authorities of the election commission. Ramesh? Amit, thank you. That was Amit Mukherjee reporting on the second phase of the great Indian election. Amit, thank you. Appreciate it. And still to come on DD India News Hour. 
U.S. State Department spokesperson says that Washington, D.C. wants to see everyone in Pakistan treated consistent with the rule of law. And Iran continues to blame Israel for an attack on its consulate in Syria's capital, Damascus. Turning crisis into opportunity. Transforming ideas into action. Stories of real change. Tales of sustainable solution. This series is going to tell stories of such change makers. Watch Change Makers on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. In some more news about elections in India, India's Minister of State for Information Technology and BJP leader Rajiv Chandrasekhar will take on Shashi Tharoor of the Congress Party in Tiruvananthapuram in the southern Indian state of Kerala. Mr. Chandrasekhar held a roadshow in his constituency. He was accompanied by India's External Affairs Minister Subramaniam Jayashankar. Kerala BJP chief and the party's candidate from Vayanad K. Surendran filed his nomination on Thursday. Women and Child Development Minister Smriti Irani accompanied Mr. Surendran for the filing of his nomination. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi had on Wednesday filed his nomination from Vayanad constituency. Several Congress leaders, including former MP Shankar Pannu and former MLA JP Chandelia, joined the BJP in Rajasthan. In another development, the Congress party expelled Sanjay Nirupam for indiscipline and anti-party statements. After his expulsion, Mr. Nirupam accused the Congress of being a directionless party in a press conference. He says there were a number of power centers within the party. In Karnataka, JDS State Unit President and a former Chief Minister H.T. Kumaraswamy filed his nomination from Mandya Parliamentary Constituency. The BJP candidate from Bengaluru South, Tejasvi Surya, also filed his nomination and held a roadshow in the city ahead of his nomination. All right, moving on, U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said on Wednesday that the U.S. wants to see everyone in Pakistan treated consistent with the rule of law. His remarks came as a journalist asked him about the state of political prisoners in Pakistan. I would not agree with that characterization. We have made clear on a number of occasions that we want to see uh, everyone in Pakistan treated consistent with the rule of law, treated with respect for human rights, as is our position with respect to any country in the world. World leaders continue to condemn the attack on aid workers in Gaza, even as Israel says the strike was a grave mistake and apologized for the incident. In an emotional interview on Wednesday, World Central Kitchen's founder, Jose Andre accused the Israeli forces in Gaza of targeting his aid workers systematically car by car. Monday's strike, which killed seven members of his staff, was not a mistake, he said, repeating that the Israeli forces had been told of the aid workers' movement beforehand. This happened over more than 1.5, 1.8 kilometers. So this was not just uh, bad luck situation where oops uh, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place or or no this was over 1.5 1.8 kilometers with a very defined humanitarian convoy that had signs in the top in the roof uh, a very colorful logo that we are obviously very proud of but that that's very clear who we are and what we do Meanwhile, after Monday's attack, the UN on Tuesday announced a 48-hour suspension of nighttime aid movements in Gaza. The operations during the daytime continue, though. 
Seven aid workers were killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza on Monday night when they were leaving the Deir al-Bala warehouse after unloading food aid there. Meanwhile, an ambulance convoy carrying the mortal remains of those killed in the attack crossed the Rafah border after departing Gaza earlier on Wednesday. The bodies of the foreign aid workers were handed over to UN officials at the Egyptian border. U.S. President Joe Biden will speak on phone with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin on Wednesday urged Israel to take concrete steps to protect aid workers and civilians in Gaza. In a call with his Israeli counterpart, Yoav Gallant, Secretary Austin urged Mr. Gallant to conduct a swift and transparent investigation to share the conclusions publicly and to hold those responsible to account. Meanwhile, Iran continues to blame Israel for the suspected airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Syria on the 1st of April. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has said that Israel will be slapped for the same. Two Iranian generals and five military advisors were killed at its embassy compound in Damascus. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the strike. And Sarah Coates joins us from Tel Aviv for more. Sarah, what are uh, we hearing about the investigation into the attack on aid workers in Gaza? Hello there, Ramesh. Well, we do know that it is ongoing. According to a number of military sources, this investigation carried out by people within the army could be wrapped up by the end of the week with other reports that Israel may actually offer compensation to the families of these seven aid workers that were killed in that Israeli strike. Now, we're also hearing from the Institute of the Study of War, which says that senior Israeli officials actually warned prior to this attack that communication between Israeli forces on the ground inside Gaza and these aid groups was not functioning properly. Uh, certainly very, very concerning. And this comes amid calls from the World Central Kitchen for yet another investigation. They've just put out a statement saying that they want the government to preserve all documents, communications, videos and audio recordings. Now, in terms of the effect that this is all having on the ground, the World Central Kitchen has now suspended these operations in Gaza, uh, certainly very important operations just given the absolute magnitude of the situation there and the amount of people that so desperately need this aid. And as you did mention there also, the United Nations has halted its nighttime operations amid warnings from aid groups that people in Gaza are on the brink of famine, Ramesh. And talking about Israel, uh, Sarah, does Israel anticipate an Iranian attack in retaliation for the airstrike on Iran's consulate in Syria? Well, there certainly is extreme concern, a number of measures being taken here in Israel. The IDF has just announced that it's actually cancelling the home leave of combat soldiers, also calling up more reservists and bolstering the air defence systems. And here on the ground, uh, even when you're not in the army, you can actually feel uh, the tension. And I'll explain one of those things for you. If I open up my phone here, and look on my Google Maps, it'll be telling me most of the time at the moment that I'm either in Cairo or in Beirut. And this is due to the Israeli military jamming up GPS services over fears of an attack on Israel. Now, we have heard from the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, he has come out to say that there will be a reprisal over this attack, which you did mention Israel has not claimed. It rarely does claim such strikes. But this is uh, of great concern to Israel, uh, just given the sheer power of these potential missiles that Iran uh, may or is thought to have have and the impact that could happen here in Israel. So certainly very, very concerning here on the ground. And we have been hearing reports over the last few weeks that people here in Israel have actually been 
panic buying, things like generators fearing these attacks, uh, potentially not only from Iran, but also from its proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Sarah, thank you. Sarah Coates reporting there from Tel Aviv. And staying in the region, the Israeli War Cabinet member Benny Gantz has proposed holding of the national election in September, citing domestic and international pressure amidst the conflict in Gaza. Mr. Gantz said that setting a mutually agreed upon election date would provide an opportunity for the Israeli society to reaffirm its relationship with its leadership. In order to maintain unity and to overcome the challenges facing us, the public must know that soon we will once again ask for their trust, that we will not ignore the massacre of October 7 and that which preceded it. Therefore, we must agree on a date for elections in September towards a year to the war, if you will. Moving on, the two-day NATO foreign ministers meeting began in Brussels on Wednesday to discuss long-term military aid for Ukraine, including a proposed $108 billion fund. NATO members have not yet taken a decision on the structure of future aid for Ukraine, but have agreed to move forward with planning on the matter. The NATO foreign ministers are also set to meet with Ukraine's foreign minister Dmitry Kuleba on Thursday. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has said that Ukraine can rely on NATO support now and for the long haul. In our meeting today, we discussed how to put our support on a firmer and more enduring basis for the future. All allies agree on the need to support Ukraine in this critical moment. There is a unity of purpose. Today, Allies have agreed to move forward with planning for a great NATO role in coordinating security assistance and training. The details will take shape in the weeks to come. But make no mistake, Ukraine can rely on NATO support now and for a long haul. On day two of their meeting in Brussels on Thursday, NATO foreign ministers will celebrate the 75th anniversary of the alliance. On NATO's 75th anniversary, the ministers will mark the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty on 4th of April in 1949, which established the transatlantic political and military alliance. NATO began with just 12 members from North America and Europe. At its heart is the concept of collective defense. But 75 years on, NATO today has 32 members and retaken a central role in world affairs. And we'll get you the latest uh, from our correspondent on the ground in Brussels in just a bit. But still to come on DD India News, uh, Russian drones carry out multiple strikes in Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv. The son of a well-known politician of the Dominican Republic fatally shot at a gas station in the U.S. city of Houston. And a look at how wired-up coffee plants are helping farmers combat climate change. The largest state of India, Rajasthan, goes to polls in two phases. The Battle Royale for 25 looks of our seats. What are the issues on the ground and who will create a storm? Join us on DD India on the Great Indian Elections, Thursday at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT, only on DD India. The People's Republic of China captured Tibet back in the day. And is it time to consider a social media ban for kids? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India.
You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. A quick recap of the headlines. India's President Draupadi Murmu launches the country's first homegrown gene therapy for treatment of blood cancer. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi addresses an election rally at Jamuvi in the state of Bihar. Prime Minister Modi and West Bengal Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee to address rallies at Kuch Bihar in West Bengal. And the UN suspends Gaza nighttime aid movements for two days. Humanitarian food charity The World Central Kitchen called for an independent investigation into the killing of seven of its workers in the enclave. All right, going back to the top story we're tracking here on DD India News are the NATO foreign ministers meeting taking place in Brussels. Thursday is day two, the ultimate day of that meeting. And joining me is my colleague Ishan Garg. Ishan, will day two of the meeting be all about celebrating the 75th anniversary of NATO or are more meetings planned for the day? Well, day two certainly began with celebrating 75, 75th anniversary of NATO. There was a lot of um, conversation about how this organization has been resilient in its 75 years of existence. And there were also words from Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg about how U.S. and Europe need to stick together in the future as well. But going forward, looking at what's uh, up ahead in this day, there's going to be a crucial meeting between uh, the NATO members and the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister as part of the NATO-Ukraine Council meeting. And after that, we're going to see a meeting with uh, the NATO members and uh, their some of their Asia-Pacific partners, which includes representatives from uh, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and New Zealand. So we've got we've got a full schedule ahead of us. There's going to be conversations with the Ukrainian foreign minister about Ukraine's uh, long-term needs, what it needs from uh, NATO, and there's going to be conversations, uh, especially about the role of uh, China and uh, Iran in Russia's uh, war against Ukraine. So we've got a lot of meetings uh, scheduled Indeed. up ahead of us today. Ishan, you spoke about Ukraine. Any official word yet on whether NATO members have agreed on a $100 billion fund for Ukraine? Well, they're certainly discussing it. Uh, uh, Wednesday was the first time when uh, the uh, when there was a formal announcement about this process being kicked off, about the discussion of this $108 billion fund. The idea, of course, is to provide Ukraine with long-term visibility over what kind of uh, money it can have in the pipeline so as it can plan its offensive uh, in a much better way. Uh, NATO's uh, Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg says that uh, there's going to be more discussions going forward in the weeks, and uh, they will reach uh, some sort of agreement. It is expected by the NATO uh, summit uh, in Washington in July. But as of now, this is more about kickstarting a conversation about that sort of money. And of course, more about NATO taking control of some of the money in the pipeline in case uh, there is uh, uh, the U.S. tries and pulls out uh, of uh, NATO or even uh, uh, reduces its support to the military alliance. That's, uh, that's certainly an idea that's unnerving many NATO members here. And before we let you go, Ishan, according to some reports, a U.S.-led multinational group which coordinates the shipment of weapons to Ukraine could be transferred to NATO. Now, is it prompted in part by fears of Donald Trump winning the November election in the U.S.? Certainly, that, that question of uh, uh, Donald Trump is certainly front and center, and that's one of the reasons why there is conversation about, uh, you, uh, or about NATO potentially taking over some responsibilities of coordinating military supplies to Ukraine. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg said this uh, at his press briefing on Wednesday as well, and the idea is that perhaps NATO is going to take a bigger role in coordinating those supplies, which was so far the role of, uh, which has been so far the role of the Ramstein Group or the Ukraine Contact Group, which has been instrumental in getting uh, those supplies to Ukraine. This is a group of 40 countries uh, which was initially led by the US and now perhaps NATO is looking to take a bigger role at that table. Ishan, thank you. Ishan Garg reporting there from Brussels on the day two of the NATO foreign ministers meeting. In other news, Russian drones carried out multiple strikes in Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv early Thursday morning resulting in the death of at least four people and injuring 10 others. 
The repeated strikes targeted high-rise apartment blocks and private homes with at least three emergency vehicle drivers killed as they responded to the incidents. Around 350,000 residents are without power in Kharkiv following the overnight drone attack. Kharkiv's mayor, Ihor Terekhov, wrote on Telegram that there were five drone strikes in all, causing fires, building collapses and significant vehicle damage. One more person was killed in a separate strike on private homes in another district of the city. Right, shifting focus to Taiwan now, where in the aftermath of a deadly earthquake that caused massive destruction, more than a thousand people are injured, while rescue operations are underway to look out for people still trapped under the rubble. The quake has resulted in destroyed buildings and caused multiple landslides. The death toll stayed at 9 from Wednesday's 7.2 magnitude earthquake while the residents are still coping with the aftershocks and had to spend the nights outdoor. Residents are seen retrieving their belongings and collecting essentials for living. Now, many of them are left homeless as walls of their apartments are cracked and have been shifted to tents on a sports ground being used for temporary shelter. Helicopters are being used by rescuers for people stranded at mining areas, while some government personnel were deployed to help residents collect their valuables from destroyed buildings. Chris Gilbert joins us from Tokyo. Now, Chris, how is Taiwan coping with the aftermath of the earthquake? Well, reports coming from Taiwan are that, you know, things have effectively returned to normal. Of course, things are not normal. It is a day after an enormous uh, earthquake, 7.2, which, you know, tilted buildings and left dozens of people stranded. But it, it does seem as though the, the city of Hualien and the region in general has fared pretty well. And uh, it has been a positive day for uh, rescuers and, and recovery efforts. Uh, you mentioned the beginnings of the rescue of some of those miners. Uh, 80 of them uh, stranded across two quarries. And, you know, dramatic footage of, you know, about five of them being taken by a helicopter uh, released uh, earlier on Thursday. There were also, of course, the uh, 50 hotel workers who were in the hotel in the National Park who were on their way to work when the uh, earthquake hit, becoming stranded in two minibuses. And uh, uh, reports are that about half of them managed to uh, uh, travel and reach rescuers uh, earlier on Thursday uh, and uh, lead them back to the rest of the group. So it has been a very positive day uh, in terms of rescue efforts. Uh, there are still about 50 unaccounted for uh, or missing. There are about 600 in evacuation shelters, 900 displaced. So. It's by uh, a far cry, you know, uh, a normal uh, Thursday at the beginning of the Qingming Festival, uh, the four-day weekend uh, in Taiwan. But considering how bad the situation could have been, uh, reports certainly are that the city and the region uh, scraped through in reasonably good nick. Is Taiwan still experiencing the aftershocks? Oh, of course, yes. Uh, and uh, experts, uh, you know, are forecasting that they will continue for some days. Yeah, following an earthquake such as, you know, a magnitude 7.2 at such close proximity to land, uh, Hualien will be uh, experiencing aftershocks for some time. Yet, yeah, in, in in a very concentrated frequency, there have been far more than a hundred at this point, and a lot of them over four on the Richter scale. And uh, it's an important question: uh, the aftershocks, because. It is the main danger uh, that remains uh, for the people of Hualien and uh, in Taiwan in general. And of course, in other parts of the region, such as Okinawa, which received you know, tsunami warnings when uh, Wednesday's earthquake hit. Uh, and, and the danger is, of course, of complacency, people believing that the danger may have passed. The danger is also, of course, of further rock slides and mudslides, further tsunamis, further damage to infrastructure. 
Uh, but experts are also pointing out that uh, you know, Taiwan may have learned the lessons of the 1999 earthquake uh, and you know, the infrastructure has held up reasonably well. Also, Chris, uh, what can you tell us about an earthquake of six magnitude of the east coast of Honshu in Japan? Yeah, I felt that one earlier today, and uh, I tell you, you know, after after a long day of Wednesday of reporting on the earthquake in Taiwan, I was um, looking at the underside of my desk, prepared to jump down there at any given second. Uh, it was a long one, and it, it was uh, certainly one of those ones where um, you know you wait for it to get worse and see what's going to happen. But luckily, uh, it did die down after some time. Uh, it was concentrated near Iwate Prefecture. It was, as you mentioned, a magnitude 6. There have been no tsunami warnings from that. There have been no reports of damage either. It has been a very active region, that northeastern coast of Japan, uh, for tremors of this size in the last few months. And again, experts are expecting more and urging vigilance as well. So it's been a busy couple of days uh, you know, for seismic activity in the region. Um, but luckily, despite uh, a scare and, and a, and a sh strong rumble uh, in Japan, everyone uh, fared very well. All right, we'll leave it at that. Uh, Chris Gilbert in Tokyo, thank you for now. Appreciate it. Right, moving on, tens of thousands of people have fled the Haitian capital Port-au-Prince in the past weeks in a desperate bid to escape a surge in gang violence. That's according to the United Nations, which says the scale of human rights abuse taking place is unprecedented in modern Haitian history. DD India's Benji Haya has been following the developments. UN figures suggest more than 50,000 Haitians escaped the country's main city in a matter of weeks during March amid a deadly conflict between powerful armed gangs. Killings, kidnappings and sexual violence have forced residents to rural areas which the United Nations here in the US warns are not equipped to deal with such a huge influx of people. These are areas still recovering from a devastating earthquake just a few years ago. Now, some have sought to cross into the Dominican Republic, but the government there has bolstered border security and deported tens of thousands of displaced civilians back across to Haiti. The poverty-stricken Caribbean state has been in the throes of an internal crisis, teetering on the collapse and a potential civil war as gangs took over swathes of the nation. The Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, resigned last month from the US territory of Puerto Rico to Haiti's east on the same day that the United States announced an additional 100 million US dollars to finance the deployment of a multinational force to assist Haitian police. On Monday, Haiti's de facto government issued a statement saying its leaders were working toward a peaceful transition of power as fast as possible. Benji Haya in Washington, reporting for DD India. All right, now take a look at some more stories making news around the world. Police in the U.S. city of Houston in the state of Texas are searching for four suspects after the son of a well-known Dominican Republic politician was fatally shot at a gas station on Monday. The victim, identified as Luis Alfredo, is the son of Alfredo Pacheco, who serves as the president of the Chamber of Deputies of the Dominican Republic. Wired-up coffee plants are helping farmers combat climate change. At the Utengule coffee farm in Tanzania, researchers are monitoring 20 Arabica coffee plants that are wired up across the plantation. Each plant is attached to electrodes that monitor the heat and warmth of the atmosphere. Using this technology will provide researchers the continuous updates on their health and hydration. French comedy The Second Act will open this year's 77th Cannes Film Festival, the organizers confirmed on Wednesday. Many movies from across the world to showcase their talent in the big screen of French movie theatres. This year's Cannes Film Festival runs from 14th to the 25th of May. And still to come on DD India News Hour. 
Will India's Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, keep the lending rate unchanged at 6.5% for the seventh time? Gujarat Titans to face Punjab Kings in the Indian Premier League. It's a key match for the Punjab Kings as it has suffered back-to-back -back defeats. And Turkmenistan hosts a fidgetal sports competition combining physical and digital disciplines. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024, the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on DD India. How did the People's Republic of China capture Tibet back in the day? Is it time to consider a social media ban for kids? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. And now to some business news. India's Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India's first bi-monthly monetary policy committee meeting for the year 24-25 is on in Mumbai. RBI Governor will deliver the statement on 5th April. The Central Bank's last such meeting had maintained the key interest rate unchanged at 6.5% for the sixth straight time. The S&P 500 and Nasdaq ended slightly up on Wednesday after data showing the U.S. services industry growth slowed further in March. Most of the major S&P 500 sectors advanced, led by materials and energy. U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve's chair, Jeremy Powell, focused on the need for more debate and data before interest rates are cut and limited the advance. Meanwhile, Asian shares rallied on Thursday. The yen slid against everything except the dollar and boosted Japanese stocks. Tokyo's Nikkei bounced 1.6%. The Indian stock market benchmarks, the Sensex and Nifty 50, hit their fresh all-time highs in early trade on Thursday. The Sensex opened at its fresh all-time high of 74,501.73 while Nifty opened at 22,592.1. Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai has said that the company is highly committed to making sure it gets its artificial intelligence chat models right while retaining the trust of its users globally. Pichai was speaking at the inaugural 2024 Business, Government and Society Forum at the Stanford Graduate School of Business on Wednesday. He said getting the technology right was a business imperative and that Google and its parent company Alphabet were doing the right thing as a North Star for the users.
And now to all the news in the world of sport with my colleague Deepika Mehto. Deepika, what do you have for us today? IPL and a lot more. That includes F1 also. Let's, so let's quickly take our viewers through all the buzz from the world of sports. So to begin with cricket, Gujarat Titans will take on Punjab Kings in match number 17 at Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad today. Titans' new captain, Shubman Gill, has marshaled his team to two victories in three games with both the victories coming at home. Gujarat Titans Titans have a chance to move to the top half of the IPL points table if they manage to win against Punjab Kings today. Meanwhile, if you talk about Punjab Kings, they have started their season with a victory against Delhi Capitals at their new home, which is Mulanpur, but suffered back-to-back -back losses on the road in Bengaluru as well as Lucknow. On to soccer, Liverpool is all set to face Sheffield United in Premier League clash tonight. Jurgen Klopp's side is currently on second spot in the Premier League's point table as Arsenal took the lead. So now, after Arsenal and Manchester City already picked up victories, the pressure is firmly on Liverpool to win in order to return to the top of the Premier League points table. So they can go two points clear of league leaders Arsenal with a victory, while this game is also a chance to pad their goal difference. So while Liverpool are huge favourites against Sheffield United, who have just three victories and 15 points this season, Klopp dismissed the notion that he might rest the players to focus on Sunday's clash against Manchester United at Old Trafford. Earlier, United eliminated Liverpool from the FA Cup in a 4-3 quarter-final thriller after extra time two weeks ago. More on soccer, Kylian Mbappe's strike propelled Paris Saint-Germain into the French Cup finale with a comfortable 1-0 victory over Stade Reno, taking them one step closer to a 15th trophy. A dominant PSG looked set to take the lead early in the game, but the goalkeeper, Steve Mandinda, thwarted their attempts and saved a penalty from Mbappe. However, the 25-year-old striker opened the scoring three minutes later, latching onto a pass from Fabian Ruiz for his eighth goal of the tournament at the Parc du Princes, they erupted in joy too. So PSG will face Olympic Lyonnais in the cup finale which is scheduled to take place on the 25th of May after the beat 3-0 Valenciennes FC on Tuesday. Rennes were desperate for an equaliser in the second half to force a penalty shootout but a Martin Terrier effort was the best that they could muster while Mandanda denied PSG a further advantage to it. PSG who are currently at the top of the League 1 stand face Clement Foot on Saturday. On to tennis, Sumit Nagel lost in three sets against at least Lorenzo Sonego in the round of 16 at Mar Marrakech Open, an ATP 250 event in Morocco that took place on Wednesday. World number 95, Sumit began his clay season by defeating Frenchman Corentin in the opening round. In the, uh, and he took the first set by 6-1 against Sonego. However, the fourth-seeded Italian, who's currently 61, pounds back to clinch the second set by 6-3 and the decider by 6-4. Sumit was looking forward to reach the quarterfinals of a tour-level event for only the second time in his career. But this was his second straight defeat against 6-3 tall Italian after the first round clash of the CS Dubai Championships. Meanwhile, in men's doubles category, India's Yuki Bhambri and his French partner Albano Olivetti reached the quarterfinals with a 6-3 and 6-4 victory over Dutch Greek duo of Bart Stevens and Petros Tsitsipas. On to F1 now, four-time world champion Sebastian Vettel on Wednesday said he's thinking about making his return to Formula 1 amid ongoing discussions with Mercedes boss Toto Wolff. Vettel retired in the year 2022 after 16 seasons in F1 but has since been regularly linked with a possible return to the grid. Mercedes have a 2025 seat to fill following Lewis Hamilton's decision to join Ferrari. Meanwhile, Red Bull, the team Vettel won in his four drivers' title with, could also have a vacancy with Sergio Perez's contract expiring soon. So that was a quick wrap from the world of sports. Back to you. Thank you, Deepika. Appreciate it.
And before we close, I want to take you to Turkmenistan, where the opening ceremony of the Fidgetal Sports Competition took place at the State Institute of Physical Culture and Sports on Wednesday. Now, Fidgetal is a new sport that combines traditional disciplines with virtual competitions. The name of the direction comes from two English words, physical and digital. Now, this is a kind of dual event. Participants compete in a video game and its real-life counterpart as well. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of DD India News. Let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and Instagram. You can also check out our website, ddindia.co.in. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I am Ramesh Ramachandran. From all of us here in New Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News.